All right, folks. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Day two of Redacted. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Jared Thompson. My name is Jared Barnes, the other Jared at the NEAR Foundation. Uh, I have the privilege of working with all of our founders and builders on NEAR. Um, and over the past few months, have had the chance to work with some incredible founders who are sitting here with us today. Um, and also more importantly, working with an incredible team at Delphi Labs to partner on our AI accelerator program. And so today, I really want to take some time to actually unpack some of these incredible use cases um, and learn a little bit more about what each of these founders are building, but also zoom out and talk about the market, talk about what's happening, and talk about where the world is going uh, in this age of AI. So just to start us off, Chi, can you kick things off? Brief introduction um, uh, and share a little bit about what led to the origin of now Kite. AI, and Kite Protocol, um, uh, and just a little bit about what you're building. Sounds great. And uh, I see some feminine face here again, <laughs> and uh, probably going to repeat what I said uh, 30 minutes ago. Um, and uh, I'm Chi, I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, Kite AI and uh, Zara Block Labs. Uh, uh, what myself uh, background is, uh, I did my PhD from um, UC Berkeley, focused on machine learning and causal inference. Right now it's probably called Explainable AI. And uh, then uh, my journey with uh, AI, again, started from PhD and after that uh, did the automated machine learning startup uh, company that is more, you know, the last generation of AI. And uh, then uh, uh, Realized data is the biggest bottleneck, so uh, join the Databricks, which right now probably one of the largest uh, data and AI infra companies in the world, um, to lead product management for their data engineering solutions. And Zadablock, so, and Kai AI. Well, uh, how we started the journey is uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, I was thinking, uh, you know, like uh, uh, the data infrastructure or like a data word is just the two hard uh, to build a robust in, a platform and infra underlying to really you know, solve some of the data silo, fragmentation, and data quality issues. Uh, and uh, when we started uh, 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 Zara and Kai in the beginning, uh, we think it's a very generic platform for solving data and then empowering AI. Um, but then we got a lot of interest and uh, requests from blockchain customers about, hey, you are building a generic platform, we know, but can you help us to you know, like, uh, solve the access to blockchain data and also bring on-chain data, uh, on -chain data and off-chain data together to you know, like, uh, empowering some user experience and uh, 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 you know, predictability of the, of the models, some AI models they're building at that time already. At that time, it's more machine learning models. Um, and uh, then we started to serving blockchain industry. And about a year ago, we started realizing, oh, actually, uh, data now is becoming like a, a bottleneck everywhere, not only in blockchain. It's literally like a lot of industries, especially if you think about uh, you know, AI GC content, building a video and audio, those type of data. All those model builders are actively eager almost like hungry about how can I access like the high quality uh, multimodal data to train the models. And this is where we see, oh, the data shortage, data access problem is become like a universal everywhere. So now uh, what Kai AI is building is an open composable foundation that really democratizes AI by enabling uh, secure and uh, scalable data access across AI models, agents, and uh, helping uh, developers. Uh, so in the end of the day, our mission is to build a uh, universal framework that can foster uh, uh, accessible and uh, rich ecosystem of AI assets, including both uh, uh, data and models. Yeah. Yeah. First, thanks for having me. And uh, my name is Bob, co-founder and CEO of Questflow. What we're building is a multi-agent orchestration layer where we put multiple AI agents together in a swarm and ask these AI agents to take action for you autonomously and earn rewards on chain. Uh, our original story is pretty simple. Like two years ago, we saw the original demo of AutoGPT, if you guys remember that moment. Uh, it was a very cool demo back in the days that you can just talk about what you want to do using natural language, describe uh, the user intent, and then they translate that into basically a bunch of AI agents working together and taking, taking action for you. 
But back in the days, if you actually use AutoGPT in your daily life, you realize it's not really useful. Uh, it's not really integrating with any of the tools that you're using on a daily basis. It's not really integrating with, let's say, Twitter, uh, Notion, Airtable, all the regular tools that you, you want to actually use in your daily workflow. So that's why our name comes from, which is we can simply describe a quest and then translate that into an agentic workflow. Um, so we started working on this for almost two years ago, and for the per first year, it actually started as a, a Web2 project. It started as, hey, just uh, let's create a like a multi-agent uh, framework and just you know just get started. But after a year of working on this, we realized that there are a bunch of uh, like creators of these AI agents that not only they want to create AI agents, but also they want to get paid. Uh, this is more like the creator economy of what we are trying to do is uh, we want to not only have the demand side, which is you can translate user intent into uh, an agentic workflow, but on the other side where we allow creators to build their own AI agents uh, and all these agents will have their wallet as well and they'll be able to, on one side, uh, getting the work done, on the other side, not getting paid. So pretty much that's where we are right now and um, yeah, everything is live, you can just give it a try. Hi, uh, my name is Yang Tang. I'm the CEO of QSTAR Labs. Um, so our team is really building around autonomous AI agents. Um, so we're starting with a platform we're going to roll out this month called Mimetica. And so if, when you think about AI agents, um, you have to think of AI agents as a remote worker. Uh, in order for an AI agent to be really useful, they have to be able to autonomously perform tasks on your behalf. Um, so we've all kind of seen, you know, the explosion in generative AI. There's a couple things missing, though, in, for this to be an actual application. The first is, you know, an AI agent needs strategic long-term behavior. Um, and what's important about this is, you know, we have a lot of expertise in reinforcement learning. Um, our team really has a very strong TradFi plus research background. And I think a lot of people will appreciate that. TradFi was the first place where machine learning was deployed at scale. Um, you know, almost the entire U.S. stock market and the majority of, you know, the global bond market now trades electronically. So it, it does work. It works extremely well. It's extremely efficient, right? The human mind is good at certain things. It's not good at others. Uh, so, you know, it, for an agent framework to really work is you have to have some combination of both. You have to be able to take strategic long-term behavior. Um, the second really, you know, why we're going down the influencer route and then building a agentic function behind it is, you know, if you think about the world in five years, there's going to be 100 billion plus AI agents. It could be in the trillions. Uh, we don't really know, but it's a very large number. Uh, you can't go up to someone on day one and go, hey, man, um, give me all your money. My AI agent's going to run it, right? People will just laugh at you. There's been 15 to 20 robo-advisor startups in the U.S., and they've all failed. So you have to go down a route where people have some comfort with your product, your brand. That's where the AI influencer platform is extremely powerful. Um, people connect with it, people learn, engage, and grow. And then you start pushing the adjunctive functionality behind it in certain verticals that you know how to train. Um, so a lot of the secret sauce also is in training for a specific application. Um, so I guess I'll stop there. Um, hi. My name is Lucas. I'm the, one of the co-founders of the company called Almanac. And Almanac started, I would say, around two years ago. And it started on a spreadsheet, on a very scary spreadsheet. So me and my co-founders, we've been collaborating with a lot of protocols in DeFi. And we saw how, well, millions of liquidity are being managed, or, or rather how poorly they're being managed. And we've decided we would like to create a tool that would help with the optimization of DeFi protocols. We were inspired at the time by a company called Gauntlet. Kudos to them, great company. Uh, but over time, we've realized that what we're building with agent-based modeling, with simulations, is essentially decision intelligence, right? The output of this decision intelligence was usually interpreted as something static. These were DAO proposals, these were charts, these were spreadsheets, and these are powerful tools but they are a bit slow, especially within the pace of how uh, DeFi is operating. So we, at one point, we realized this is a perfect fuel for training the agents, right? It was, it was also around the time where the, the Asian narrative was picking, picking up, the ideas was, were um, flowing um, left and right. So we've decided to build a platform that allows to build and manage financial strategies with agents. And I would agree with a lot of, lots of points that were mentioned here, especially here, that uh, mm, indeed uh, what people don't realize is around 85% of all trading uh, in the stock market is being done. It's algorithmically, algorithmically traded. Uh, I think we'll see a similar number in DeFi eventually. Uh, but what happened 
over that time, and I think this is very important, this is something where we're also positioning our product, is that DeFi grew in complexity or became so complex that at this point, I think it's impossible to navigate by yourself, plain and simple. In 2020, during the DeFi summer, I think, or I knew, a couple of people who could confidently say that they understand every single primitive and pretty much every single major protocol in DeFi. Right now, I'm not so sure. With all the layers, all the, um, all the primitives, all the bridges, understanding the complexity and quantifying it is one thing. But then executing on those rails, that's a completely different story. So a picture emerged, or at least this is something we, we see as, as a picture. DeFi was never meant for humans. It's too complex and it only grows in that complexity. And agents prepared, rightly prepared to that job can become the vehicles of your intention or objective function as we, we put it ourselves. And then can, they can carry and they can reason around what would be the best way to achieve your objective and they can help mitigate the risks around the execution. Wallets, seed phrases, bridging, left or two, or even timing it, being emotional about it. These are all human flaws that are, we are actually capping our own um, potential within DeFi. So as Almanac, we built an end-to-end -end platform that allows to build and from, first and foremost train those agents because we, we think the name of the game is in training the agents and then deploy them in a non-custodial manner. So happy to be here and uh, what a crowd. Thank you, Lucas. Um, and folks, I wanna dig in a little bit more and actually Lucas and Yang, I'm gonna start with you and then Bob and Chi, I'll come back to you. I think both what you, both you, Yang and Lucas are building on the agent side um, is both fascinating, but also could probably be quite polarizing where I think Yang AI influencers, I think that forces an illicit reaction, perhaps by some, in creating an emotional connection with AI. And I think, Lucas, the idea of perhaps the outcomes from agents managing money is enticing, but the idea of giving agents money may be fearful to some. And so curious, as you've been building um, and scaling your solutions, how have you built trust with both end users and just the customers that you're, you're working with? And what does that look like uh, for, for you both? And feel free, either one of you, to, to take that. Well, for us, we're focusing on, on financial agents. So I think to, to build that trust, um, I would say there are two components. So for us, the main thing is the, something we call the strategy optimization suite. This is the, I would say, the, the core of, of our platform. And this is where we fork uh, the blockchains and we use agent-based modeling to mimic actors' behavior, right? This is part one. Part two, we uh, replicate this environment thousands and thousands and thousands of times to give the user, in a very visible and in a very tangible way, a data-driven assurance that the agent or the portfolio of agents will do what the user wants them to do, right? So there is this tool that allows them to stress test and to analyze the, 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 how the agent will, will behave. And what's, most and more, what's even more important, what we do is we, the agent can do it by itself, right? So it's re-optimizing itself, relearning itself, and evolving over time. So there is this big um, risk management component to it, which is at the very heart of the platform. I would say that's number one. And it's very visible within the platform, so users can, over time, they can play and stress test with the, with the strategies. And the second part is around the, well, the custody and the, the deployment. So the way we work is we are a non-custodial platform. So you connect, essentially connect your own safe and grant certain permissions to the agent to only do what it, you want it to do, right? So it's not a situation where we have a, a, an agentic asset manager and you give it all your money and then you wait to, to see what happens. There is a, gradual sort of um, pathway there. And I think we will, of course, need to go through um, like a assimilation period where users need to feel comfortable with, with using this. Uh, but I think the, the price and the opportunity will be simply too big to miss, right? So doing things manually, uh, like it will, just, it will just go away. And to say, and I think this is something that is not often being mentioned on stages like this, we're all um, like played 
by the companies that are already using those tools. Like being, you're, you are being front run, you are the exit liquidity, so you are being out teched on a daily basis. And until we level that field with some of the tooling, especially with agents, that's not gonna change. And this is a very non-inclusive future of DeFi, which I think will drive it to the ground if we don't change it. Yeah, I agree with a lot of those points. Um, so if you think about kind of a user journey, right? And you know, right now there's a huge amount of interest in AI influencers and AI agents. You know, we've seen the terminal of truth. You know, we've seen a lot of different platforms show up. So there, there's, a, there's a high amount of interest at the moment. So you gotta think about the user journey, okay? And for us, the user journey is three steps. You gotta track eyeballs, you gotta retain eyeballs, and then you have to monetize eyeballs, right? Otherwise, you don't have a business, you have a hobby. So, for, I mean, so on day one, Attracting eyeballs is easy because there's a huge amount of innate interest, okay? Like two years ago, if you told people you were doing an AI influencer, right, there's the look on their face would be like shock and horror. Um, at least that was my mother's look when I told her about my company. <laughs> okay, so awesome. Today, people are seeking this stuff out. We've seen platforms show up. But largely, the platforms are going to run into a problem of retaining users. If all you have is a GPT wrapper and all you do is, you know, put out, you know, very vanilla type stuff, that doesn't really work. Um, because people play with this, and uh, if you have the, the equivalent today of a virtual Tamaguchi that sits there and like dances when you drop tokens, people are going to get bored by that real fast. Okay, so th there has to be some level of retention, right? The retention comes from interactions, it comes from building a personalized knowledge base, it comes from personalization of the user. So now you have a lot of stuff you know about the user, and the third is monetization. So the mon monetization comes because the agent becomes useful. So think of it, you know, if your favorite AI influencer goes, oh, hey, by the way, I trade crypto now, or, you know, I do sports betting now, or I do prediction markets now, or I do, you know, traditional finance now, right? So, okay, that's pretty cool. I know a lot about you. Uh, by the way, here's a couple of things I will suggest for you. Like, much as Lucas was saying, there has to be some level of trust. You have to build up the trust, and then you're able to monetize that trust. Um, and what's, you know, the, the other really cool thing I think about Web3 is, you know, we, we think about DeFi really, you know, in kind of a different, you know, different way, right? An AI agent can't walk into JP Morgan and get a bank account the same way a human can. So if you spin up a bunch of autonomous AI agents, they need to have frictionless and permissionless ways of transacting. Um, so building on Web3 for AI agents is the most logical conclusion, I think, for anyone in this space at the moment. This is why I love talking to founders, because it's so clear and direct. Thank you both. And maybe Bob and Cheetah come to you. I think what I really respect about the both of you is you uh, all have successfully abstracted away so much of the complexity of blockchain through your solutions, yet still work with a balance of Web2 and Web3 customers and, and users. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've navigated those trade-offs? And maybe, Chi, we can start with you, given that you've built such a strong foundation of a business in data indexing and just the data platform, and now actually kind of going up and down the stack, um, and just how you've worked with kind of a variety of different customers and navigated the trade-offs there. Yeah, definitely uh, appreciate the, um, the question because it's indeed very hard. <laughs> uh, and especially given that uh, in the... Uh, in the beginning, we uh, we started the business as a, you know, like a, a real sort of like a business seeking, uh, uh, you know, revenue seeking business, uh, and uh, we serve uh, actually Web three customers as no difference than Web two customers because in the end of the day, we are an infrastructure just like how AWS and uh, uh, Databricks type of people charging them. So then, from that perspective, the most important thing for your customer as an infra, a infra provider is, are you scalable? Are you reliable means you are always uptime. What's your SLA? And uh, also then, are you easy to use? It cannot be too complex to you know, like, uh, uh, adopt the thing. So indeed, a lot of thing we do is uh, abstract away the complexity. Um, so indexing blockchain data is very complex for a lot of people. Storing those data in a, you know, like a cost-effective way is very, uh, is very uh, time-consuming or even like a expertise-seeking uh, 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 thing. So that's from the blockchain side. Similarly for uh, Web2 data. Actually, Web2 data in that way is even more tricky than Web3 data because um, blockchain data is at least public data. So in the end of the day, everybody can access it. Uh, you just need some engineers to help you index it and uh, decode it to make it human readable in a you know, tabular format. But for Web2 uh, 
uh, data, then that involves all the things about data copyright, data privacy, data ownership, attribution, all those things. So, uh, but that is also why I was amazed by blockchain's capability in this process because um, blockchain as an immutable ledger can really help us build uh, one of the strongest foundation to bring the provenance and governance of the data and model in the process. Um, so that is what we have been, um, you know, like building over the past uh, uh, two and a half years. And in terms of uh, uh, navigating uh, the customers from a more practical way, I think very important is uh, you have to speak their language. Um, so when we are talking to, uh, for example, uh, Web3 customers, of course, they are very familiar with all the terms we talk about, uh, blockchain, uh, uh, smart contract, DeFi, and all those stuff. But for a lot of Web2 customers, especially some of the enterprise people we're uh, uh, talking to and using our customer, uh, platforms, we're like, don't even mention blockchain. It's a, it's a, special, it's a specialized distributed system that is having some immutable characteristics. Well, well said, well said. <laughs> and, uh, with uh, some cryptographic, <laughs> yeah. So it's essentially you have to abstract away all those terms that uh, they're not familiar with and uh, use, and also like when, you know, when you talked about how you engage or like a bring like the privacy there, you have to use the terms like, oh, it's like on, on primus, like a in, in private cloud type of term that uh, all make them understand. So anyways, I think the most important thing is understand your customer and to speak their language uh, and uh, provide the solution that they really need and uh, uh, leave the rest of the thing all kind of uh, hide it away. Um, that is the, um, that's just the, 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 the practice we do when, when it comes to sell to customers. Yeah. Um, yeah. For us, I think there are two main mod models that we like follow every time like we're designing a product. One is the YC one, like basically make something people want. Because if you're 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 talking about a lot of crypto products, they they kind of put one layer on top of each other to make it more complex in a way that it's very hard for users to even navigate the UI and UX. So for us, we kind of want to say, hey, like who is the end customer? The end customer in our case is like a professional consumer who wants to automate some of tasks and they just want to make things more efficient. So for them, they're just regular users who wants to just talk like, talk with ChatGPT and getting things done. So that's like the making something people want part that we want to abstract away all the things that users don't have to know. They can just use it like a chat chatbot, but actually there are a lot of magic behind the scene. And the second thing that we are uh, really focused on is using crypto as a necessity, not just a narrative. The necessity part is, you know, like for in our case, because we are creating multi-agent swarms, uh, multiple agents working together to help you get things done. So one necessary part is you have to have autonomous profit sharing across multiple AI agents because all these AI agents are running inference and the inferencing cost is adding up every single time they're using it. So there's no way for you to use, quote unquote, the regular web two ways of using Stripe to pay out every single month to these individual agents. Um, it's just not work. So in this case, uh, crypto is kind of like a necessity because you have to have autonomous profit sharing to handle all these microtransactions uh, on chain. And it's a perfect match of, you know, uh, blending into crypto and AI into like one single product. So for us, we were like, okay, for users, they want just to get things work. So they want a very simple experience, they want a chatbot, and they do just want to automate tasks. But for creators, they want to get paid uh, on time and real time. So that's the part that we're gonna integrate blockchain into AI, and you know, for them, they can participate. And the third thing that we're adding into this right now is not only you can participate as a user, as a creator, but also as an investor of these AI agents. Uh, you already, probably everybody already see it, Luna and all these you know, AI agents on chain, and I think for us, it's also like the third missing piece where all these AI agents swamps should be able to uh, not only create them, use them, but also participate early on as an investor of these AI agents swamp. So yeah, that's basically what we're working on right now. I'm very excited about it. Really appreciate you sharing that. And maybe just to build off of that, I want to go kind of a bit more rapid fire here. I think each of you are building such dynamic and innovative solutions within your respective vertical and niche within the stack. Obviously, there's no secret that Web2 AI is moving incredibly fast as well, and the market is moving incredibly fast, and consumer behavior is also quite shifting incredibly fast, right? I think probably for the first time I feel comfortable delegating tasks to an agent in a way that I probably wouldn't even have comprehended six to 12 months ago. And so curious, as you guys think about your future-facing roadmap, how do you think about the balance of kind of keeping pace versus the, the assumptions and what you believe to be true today? 
right? And, and anyone, feel free to take that. Um, move, move maybe forward. I can. Yeah, maybe I can start. So for us, uh, we have a framework that uh, we define some of the actions as "quote unquote" critical actions that have to have human in the loop in order to, you know, actually move things forward. For example, like if you're just retrieving information, you know, using perplexity that you don't, you don't have to, you know. You don't have to make sure that all the things come out is safe and secure and all these things because it's not really a critical action, let's say. But if you are using AI to help you to, you know, managing your Twitter account like what uh, like AI influencers are doing, that it's definitely a very high risk, you know, like like thing that you have to do. So in that case, you have to involve human in the loop. Um, I think like QSTAR definitely did a lot of things on that end, and with human in the loop, it kind of give the feedback to the AI agents to to perform even better along the way. So I was like, okay, that, that's something that we think about uh, a lot, yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting what you mentioned about Web2 AI, right, is, you know, right now, the Web2 AI has moved, I think, faster than anyone's expectations. But the reality is the applications are very sparse. So you gotta think of the world as, you know, kind of two places, right? There's people that do applications and then people that do inference infrastructure and research. Uh, and they coexist, right? It's not like Web3 and Web2 could not coexist together in this space. Um, but what's really going to be interesting is there's going to be some applications that the Web 2 that just cannot handle, that Web 3 is going to be much better at, and there's going to be some things that Web 3 will not be able to achieve proper scale at that you have to go to Web 2 for. Yeah, I agree, agree with all of that. Uh, from our side, I would say the Web 2 AI has been there long enough for us to see behavior patterns or user patterns uh, I think the chatbot experience is something that we're seeing solidifying more and more, and users are accustomed to, and they will perhaps even expect. So for us, we are we plan to have a, a tool like this. Uh, I think in Q2 already next year that will assist with uh, building the the strategy for the agents you want to use. But at the same time, I think um, in order to break away from from that and really be an innovator here, you need to propose something completely new, right? And for us, for example, that would be um, the idea that you want to start focusing on the creativity within DeFi and ideas, and then delegating that co the, the complexity, uh, complexity of how to do it to, to agents, rather than analyzing those things yourself and then getting into that never-ending loophole, which you know, back in the day, the rabbit hole was something positive. I think it lost its merit over time because right now it's a full-time job. So I think there is a balance there. You need to balance out what, what users are expecting, what they like, what they want, with a unique value proposition because that also ties up to the competition, right? Because the AI is you know, generating so much demand right now that you know, LLM lab wrappers just won't do. You need to propose something new. Um, so I think I'm a little bit biased towards uh, uh, doing something usable and fast first. Um, so the reason is, uh, uh, I, you know, uh, we all probably know Web3 has been received a lot of criticism about uh, building something that is not in, you know, like really being able to use uh, uh, in, in short term. Uh, and uh, I think this is very critical for crypto AI projects to really not fall into the same uh, practice as before, because now we have very clear uh, treatment versus control, or A versus B, A-B testing right now. Like literally everybody who are interested in AI or want to use AI to empower their, their, their life and uh, their business have choice in Web2. Uh, so in order for us to really win this game, or at least have our own position to demonstrate that blockchain and the crypto can both be very useful for AI. Blockchain as a technology, crypto as a you know, token incentive mechanism to really be useful for AI. We need to show something tangible and show something that's usable as fast as uh, Web2 AI. Um, because I think that's the only way, to, uh, way, only way to really let the mainstream people and less technical people to understand that we're saying something real um, and uh, it's, uh, it, you know, it's coming. Yeah. So we have one minute. In one sentence or less, your biggest prediction for AI in 2025? And Chi, we can start with you and go down the line. Um, I think people now realize investing only into infrastructure is really not returning the, the, returning the expectation of people want. So I think now people really start thinking about AI application. What's the use cases that uh, uh, models and agents can be used for now? Yeah, my prediction is just near probably gonna double the price. And hit $10 yeah, soon. 
I think there's going to be a lot more users in AI applications in six months than people realize. I think uh, the agents themselves, various kinds of them interacting with each other and creating something new that we didn't expect, I would say that. Folks, can we give a round of applause for founders building the future of AI? <laughs> Amazing. Um, we are incredibly proud of these teams, uh, specifically in our accelerator program. Um, we'll be hanging out for the rest of the day outside if you want to come find us, learn more about these amazing founders and products. But thank you all, and we'll turn it back to our MC.